summarizes the uh, sequential etching and LET analysis of uh, CR39 detectors used in code deposition experiments done at SRI. And based on their results, we saw 2.45 MeV neutrons, 2 to 14 MeV protons, 2 to 15 MeV alphas, as well as 14.1 MeV neutrons. And it took eight years, but we were able to publish these results in back-to-back -back papers last year in the International Journal of Hydrogen Energy. Well, we got to thinking, are these protons and neutrons energetic enough to fission uh, uranium? So here we have the neutron and proton fission cross-sections for uranium-238, and it's very similar for 235. And here I have the energies of our neutrons and protons indicated. And you can see that based on these energies, we should be able to fission uranium. So we set up our experiment. We have our cathode, our, our plastic cell, where is that thing? Plastic cell here, our cathode has a uranium wire about one centimeter in uh, length. We wrapped a gold wire around it. We put it in contact with a CR39 detector and we placed it in a lead cave right next to a germanium detector. Now one thing we don't know what will happen is that Uranium also electrolytically loads with deuterium. And there was earlier work done by John Dash and DeFore, which indicated that uranium could also undergo Lunar reactions. So we had no idea if this will enhance what we were seeing or not. Besides the uh, real-time germanium uh, measurements, we have our in-situ CR39. We also obtained gamma ray spectra in, uh, of the spent cathode in a Compton-suppressed lead cave. We did liquid scintillation counting of the spent cathode material as well as SCM EDX analysis of the uh, spent cathode material. So here are the results of our uh, real-time germanium measurements. First off, we did not take a background spectrum at the beginning. We thought we could do it at the end of the experiment. That was, that was not good. Also, I will point out that the lines we see, whoops, the lines, come on. the lines we see here are primarily due to the lead cave and the background. Even though uranium is giving off gamma emissions, we're not seeing it as being swamped by the background. But we still went on forward and we applied a current of negative 0.4 milliamps and things are plating out. And I started noticing some weird things happening. First off, our germanium detector has an aluminum window in it, and it has a t that cuts off anything below 25 keV. Yet, as you can see here, we have a signal below 25 keV. Uh, the only thing that can go through that aluminum window would be neutrons. And we also notice that instead of a nice uh, level baseline that we normally see with uh, our gamma ray measurements, and we've done lots of gamma ray measurements in the past, we see these humps showing up here, here, and here. And we also see our signals uh, decreasing. Uh, the uh, neutrons, we, we found out early, later that these pumps correspond roughly to neutron energies of 1, 2.45, and 14.1 MeV. Here is a more detailed analysis of those uh, detect, uh, these gamma lines. Uh, we, uh, time normalized them, and we corrected the baseline. So at 8.30, everything's looking pretty good. They're nice, sharp lines. At 1 o'clock, they're starting, they're still looking pretty good, a little noisy, maybe a little bit decrease in intensity. By 5 o'clock, we see an, uh, that they're not looking too good. The lines are, are smaller. And the next day, they're looking pretty crappy. Uh, we look at the potassium line. At 8.30, we have a nice symmetric potassium line that fits to a single Gaussian. Uh, here at the next day, that potassium line is, is not as intense. It has a slope in it, fits to two Gaussians. We sent these spectra, as well as the previous spectra, to the Ortec uh, technicians, and they confirmed that we had neutron damage of our detector. Now, we can estimate the average energy of those neutrons. One way is to look for the 5.96 and 6.91 keV lines, which are due to germanium-74 and germanium-72. Well, we didn't see those lines, but that's okay. You're only going to see those lines if you have neutron energies of 1 MeV or less. If you have larger en uh, energies of neutrons, that peak broadens out, and by the time you get to 4 MeV, it becomes part of the background. So we know from that that our neutron energy, average neutron energy is more than 4 MeV. 
Pat McDaniel, our co one of our co-authors, did a Monte Carlo calculation of the germanium recoil spectrum. And he did it for both uh, fission neutrons, which have energy of 2 MeV, as well as uh, 6.3 to 6.8 MeV neutrons. And you can see that this baseline looks more like what we saw. So our average energy is on the order of 6.3 to 6.8 MeV. Now we, of course, had our CR39 detector in there. And uh, there were, of course, a lot of tracks because of the uranium. But we always look in the areas that are less dense. And we saw these elongated tracks here, which are very similar to the DT neutron elongated tracks. These elongated tracks are due to neutron generated proton recoils. And Gary Phillips uh, did a study where he looked at the length of those tracks versus the energy of the neutrons. And you can see our length of our tracks falls here. And that could be anywhere from 0.114 to 14.8 MeV neutron energies. We, of course, also saw a lot of triple tracks in this experiment, more than we usually see with our normal co-deposition experiment. Uh, here we have uh, new, our new tr triple tracks we saw with our composite cathode, and these are DT neutron uh, generated triple tracks. Uh, triple tracks are diagnosed at the carbon breakup reaction. The threshold energy for this reaction is 9.6 MeV for the neutron. Uh, we also see that we have different shapes for these tracks, and that's because the carbon breakup reaction has five different reaction pathways that it can take. One thing we saw in these experiments that we never saw in any of our other co-deposition experiments were these tracks here, these long cylindrical tracks, and they're very shallow. And those are due to high Z materials, and those high Z particles, and that can only come from fission tracks. And to verify that, we took a uranium wire, put it against CR39, and exposed that to DT neutrons. And we saw the same kind of tracks here. This track is not as wide as this one because this is a one hour etch versus a six hour etch. So this is direct evidence that we have uh, fissioned the uranium. Well, at the end of the experiment, uh, we took the cell apart. Uh, we saw no evidence of the uranium wire. Uh, when it loads with deuterium, it breaks down, but it's still conductive and it's still accumulated on the cathode. But as soon as we turned off the current, the deposit uh, sloughed off of the, of the gold wire. A uh, month after the termination of the experiment, Larry took the uh, spent cathode and some of the deposit to the University of Texas to obtain gamma ray spectra in a Compton suppressed lead cave. And here we have the spectrum of the uranium wire, native uranium wire, as well as our composite cathode. And you can see that there are differences. Uh, Larry did take an attempt to identify the new lines that we see, uh, but he had no luck with it. So a couple months ago, I started to look at it because these lines have to be due to something. And uh, I'm retired now, so I have plenty of time. And so we'll look at this region over here blown up here. So I'm looking at the tables, and uh, nothing's matching up with the gamma rays. Uh, if I have a line here, for instance, I should have other lines elsewhere in the spectrum, which I don't see. So I finally got to an entrance that said gold with no isotope listed. And these are stimulated x-rays of gold. And if you look at the uh, intensities and positions, that match up very nicely with what we see. So these are stimulated x-rays of gold. And what's stimulating those x-rays are the alphas and gammas from the uranium material present. Well, that wasn't too exciting. So then we looked at this region here. There's three lines. Again, looking at the tables, nothing is matching up. And uh, finally got to an entrance that said americium with no isotope listed. So these are stimulated x-rays of americium. And if you look at the intensities and positions of those, they match up pretty nicely with these guys. And this peak is kind of broad and can very well be overlapping peaks here. Well, I said to myself, well, if this is americium, I should have a 59.5 keV gamma line. And if you look over here, you see that gamma line. So what's causing the production of americium? Well, the most likely 
uh, scenarios summarized here. Uranium-238 takes a neutron, eventually becomes plutonium-239. This undergoes two uh, successive neutron captures to form plutonium-241, which decays into americium-241. The cross-sections for this reaction is phenomenal. For thermal neutrons, the cross-section is over 200 barns. For fast neutrons, it's on the order of a barn. Uh, you, there's no point in looking for gamma lines from the plutonium species because these species are beta and alpha emitters. They have no appreciable gamma lines whatsoever. So that brings us to the question of what do you form when you fission uranium? Well, first off, you, it, fissioning of uranium is, is usually, you know, bimodal and uh, results in several hundreds of isotopes, uh, radionucleotides. And most of these radionucleotides uh, decay pretty rapidly, and most of them are beta emitters. Well, the only technique I have to look for beta emitters is liquid scintillation counting. So that's what we did. We took our, some of our deposit, put it in a, a cocktail in a vial, and, then, and we obtained spectra as a function of time, and they're shown here, some of them. And uh, a lot of stuff is going on here. And it's been taking me a few months, and I'm still analyzing the data, but it's taken me a few months to kind of get an understanding of what's going on. Besides the decay of whatever products we produce in our reaction, we also have to worry about what happens when we break the, ra the uh, radioactive decay chain of the, radi of the uranium. So to simulate that, we took a piece of uranium, put it in a lithium chloride solution, and that causes the uranium to break down. And we took that deposit, put it in a cocktail, and measured it as a function of time and those spectra are shown here. Now, the uh, cocktail responds to alpha, betas, and gammas, and you can easily differentiate the alphas from the betas and gammas because the alphas show up as this nice narrow peak as opposed to the betas and gammas which show up as broad peaks. And the first thing we notice is that with the lithium chloride one, we get this peak growing in that's due to uh, the alphas from uranium-238 and uranium-234. And the reason why it's growing in is because our deposit is at the bottom of the, of the vial. Alphas and betas don't penetrate much. So initially, you don't see them. You have to wait for the stuff to get into solution in the cocktail so it goes up to where you, the PMTs can see their emissions. And that's what's happening here. And it's happening here as well. We see the uranium-238 and 234 showing up. Uh, later on, we saw another peak growing in, another alpha peak that doesn't show up here. This alpha peak is showing up at about 3.2 MeV. The lowest energy alpha from uh, the decay of uranium occurs at 3.7 MeV, so it can't be due to that. The only things that uh, we found that would be count for this uh, alpha peak are either platinum 190 or gandolinium 148. Those will both occur at about 3.2 MeV and they both have rel relatively long lives and they both would be fission products. We also see that uh, we don't see much changes here or here as compared to what we saw with our deposit from the end of the experiment. Uh, again, we're still analyzing these data but it looks like we're having beta and gamma emitters growing in as things further decay. But again, we're still analyzing those data. We did obtain SCM EDX analysis of our deposit. Uh, here's the SCM of the wire, and here's a close-up here of the area where we got the EDX spectrum. We don't see the cauliflower uh, deposit that we normally see with co-deposition here. It looks pretty flattened. Uh, there's hardly any deposit on there. We see quite a few of the lines due to the gold substrate that we plated on. But we see additional lines. We see the palladium, we see the uranium lines. We also see lines due to sodium, zinc, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, iron, and chromium. We typically see iron and chromium and zinc and aluminum when we do B-field experiments of co-deposition. But in those experiments, uh, if you saw my poster, those experiments show a very tiny palladium peak, and we always interpreted that to mean that the palladium was getting fission, and this was supported by the long-range alphas we saw in our CR39, because they can only come from ternary fission. Uh, so we hypothesized that the reason why we see such a large palladium peak is, is that it's a fission product from the uranium, but again, we're still working on the data analysis of that. 
So in conclusion, we've observed energetic particles as a result of PDD code deposition that include the 2.47, greater than 2.47 uh, MeV protons, greater than 7 MeV alphas, 2.2 to 2.5 MeV neutrons, as well as greater than 9.6 MeV neutrons. And the protons and neutrons are energetic enough to fission uranium-235 and uranium-238. We did an experiment uh, on a gold uranium composite cathode. From the real-time uh, germanium results, we saw changes in the baseline that indicated that neutrons of an average energy of 6.4 to 6.8 MeV were generated. Our CR39 detector showed tracks due to proton recalls with energy of the neutrons of between 0.114 and 14.8 MeV. We also saw triple tracks, so the threshold energy of that is 9.6 MeV. And we also saw tracks due to high Z fragments, which were indicative of fissioning of the uranium. We did uh, germanium measurements in a Compton suppressed lead cave that showed the evidence of americium-241 production, which res again results from neutrons. Our liquid scintillation counter measurement showed uh, beta products as well as alpha products uh, due to the fission products from the fissioning of uranium. And our SCM EDX measurements of the composite showed the presence of new elements, again indicative of fissioning. So these results show that a hybrid fusion fission reactor is possible based upon co-deposition, and there's a lot of advantages of such a reactor. It doesn't require enrichment of uranium-235, it doesn't produce greenhouse gases, it's easily shut off, and it has the potential to dispose of long-lived radioactive uh, fission products that have been produced in a, by conventional nuclear power plants, and these things are, are stored in, all over the world. And of course, we have to acknowledge our support from DITRA as well as internal Navy funds. We uh, acknowledge the fact that Stan Spock developed the code deposition concept, and we thank Frank Gordon, my former department head, for all the support he gave us and top cover he gave us. We thank Fran Tanzella of SRI for conducting the experiment that resulted in not only the most analyzed CR39 detectors, but also the most traveled. We also thank uh, the folks at the National Security Technologies Laboratory for exposing our CR39 detectors to DT neutrons. Uh, Sheldon Landon of the University of Texas at Austin for obtaining our spectra in the Compton suppressed lead cave, and Ozzy Sanadi for obtaining our SCM EDX measurements. Thank you. Am I that predictable? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, out of idle curiosity, um, can uranium in the solution be co-deposited? If you had like, is there a uranium uh, thorite or something? Uh, well, Craven's and Letts did experiments where they had uranium and thorium salts and uh, saw excess heat when they used those salts in their co-deposition experiments. We were about ready to start those experiments when we were shut down in 2011. And they also absconded with my thorium and ura uranium salts. They kept the lanthanum ones, though. <laughs> if you could go back about two or three slides to where you show the products uh, that were produced. Right there. Go forward one. Uh, iron, zinc, aluminum, silicon, magnesium, chromium, and sodium. sodium. Yes. They are not the typical elements uh, that you get. Those we fission. have seen primarily with when we have just regular co-deposition. Okay. And if, if you saw my poster, I, I showed that uh -huh. uh, with the magnetic field, but I also showed that the palladium peak was very tiny. And most of the deposit had, of course, sloughed off of, of this uh, cathode. Okay. And, uh, well, we saw a huge palladium peak with the, this experiment as opposed to our B-field experiment, and so we're postulating that the palladium is a, a fission product of the uranium, and that is a common one. Right, but those, those are not... No, but I, I uh, propose that those are due to the, the palladium itself. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, well, thank you again, Pam.